right, let's jump in the word. It's interesting, I'm not going to go to a resurrection story. Uh, all week long, I kept dwelling on John 11 uh, with Lazarus, the story of Lazarus. And uh, it's really a powerful story, and I, I want to start reading it for you. Let's go to verse 11. Uh, these things he said after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. <laughs> However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking the rest in sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> so in other words, he was speaking allegorically. He's sleeping, but actually Lazarus was dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Jesus purposely waited till he died. He purposely waited so that God could be glorified. See, sometimes we think we know God's timing, but we really don't know God's timing. Sometimes we even get mad at God because he didn't do it when we said, it's like somehow he's a little puppy dog. God, do this now and do that then. And we get frustrated with God. And the verse 16 says, then Thomas, remember Doubting Thomas? Later on, he's called Doubting Thomas, but this time he's called the twin. Do you know why they call Thomas the twin, Ron? Do you know why? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. It's because he looked like Jesus. Historians say that he actually looked like Jesus, which became really dangerous for him because imagine you're the guy that looks like Jesus and everybody wants to kill you. Uh, I mean, I've been mistaken often for George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and it's really embarrassing. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Some of our guests are going, really? <laughs> he doesn't look at all like him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I like Thomas says this, hey, let's go up there that we may die with him. <laughs> in other words, because it was really dangerous for Jesus to go back to Galilee. And uh, in November, we're bringing a tour to Israel. And you're going to find that, that uh, Bethany uh, is like t just, what, two miles away. So it's right outside of Jerusalem. And uh, that's where uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. And so when you see it here, they're saying, if you go, they're going to kill you, Jesus, because it's Judea. There's a death sentence on you. Uh, and, 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 he, and then Thomas goes, hey, let's just go anyway because we're all going to die. I, I think that's kind of interesting. But then he's the one that doubted later on. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he'd already been laid in the tomb. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Why are you here at ICLV today? Some of you already know him personally. Others of you are going to come to know him personally. Because it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. This is the only religion that has a risen Savior. Buddha's dead. Krishna's dead. Muhammad is dead. You talk about any major religion in the world, they're all dead. But when you talk about Jesus, he's the only one that's alive. Come on now. I've been to the empty tomb. And I can tell you, as I walked in that tomb, for some reason all the tour buses weren't there, and I was the only one there. I walked in the tomb, and I just wept, just thinking that he's not there anymore because he's alive. He's alive. And he dwells in my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, I don't have time for religion. I really don't. Because I know what it's like to almost die. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. This next time I go, I'm going for good. Because you know, heaven's real. Jesus is real. And, and the Bible says he, uh, that all these people went to Martha and Mary to comfort, comfort them. Then Martha, as soon as she saw Jesus coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Remember, people often criticize Martha because Mary was the one at Jesus' feet and Martha was complaining. How come my sister doesn't do any work? Remember that one? You know, you know, Martha was the hard worker in the family. And Mary just loved Jesus. She just loved Jesus. And would get down to Jesus' feet. And Martha said, I'm getting mad. I'm doing all the cleaning and I'm doing all the washing. What's wrong with you, Mary? Now, but this time, guess who runs to Jesus? Martha. Isn't that interesting? Because even though we all have different personalities, we can all come to Jesus. Some of your accountants, CPAs, you're pretty, uh, as we say in French, carré, you're, you, you go with straight lines. It's a good thing. 
Some of your oak trees, you never seem to get emotional and, and you come to church, you go, why is that person crying or why is that person going to the altar? Because you're, you're not like that and, and that's okay. And there's others that are weeping willows, man. They go, oh, I love Jesus, I love you. When I go to France, they just love to kiss. Frenchies love to kiss. And I realize that when you go into those places, be careful because they're going to kiss you. In Belgium, they'll kiss you four times. Even the guys will try to kiss you guys. That's weird. It's like I have to go, here's my hand. <laughs> but you know, when you look at this, God loves you whether you're super emotional or whether you're, you're not. God loves you whether you're an accountant or you just got off the streets or you're a CPA or a lawyer or you run the government. Whatever you are, God loves you. So Martha runs to him and says to Jesus in verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She rebukes Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus being confronted by Martha? Hey, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. How many of you have ever been late for a, a, a meeting? Come on, you've ever been late? My hand is up here, come on. All right, yeah. Man, if you've been here on time, that wouldn't have happened. If, if you've been here on time. Hey, Jesus, if you've been on time... But if you read, he could have been there on time. He, he purposely didn't show up on time. Because God's not a puppy dog to go along our timing. God is God. He knows better than we do. I mean, people go, I'm so mad at God. I go, well, that means you're smarter than he is because he obviously has a plan. <laughs> I don't understand him all the time. I, I really don't. I, I don't understand why our eldest daughter had cancer. And I don't understand why, why our son had Guillaume Barre and almost died. And I, I, there's some things I just don't understand. But you know what? I, lo I love God and I trust God. And I figure he's going to help me through it, right? Because he's God and I'm not, right? Is anybody still here? So, so she says, hey, hey, if you'd been here on time, you wouldn't have died. Uh, but then she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Talk about faith. This lady has faith. I mean, she, she's tough. She's a tough gal. But she's got faith. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now see, here's the difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion has beliefs. A relationship has power. And Jesus says religion. Oh, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection in the last day. When we all get together. That's what she's saying. Well, theology tells me that he'll rise again on the resurrection day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And the life. Zoe is the word in Greek. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Now this is the most confrontational. We're starting a series called The Heart, The Cross, and The Crown. There's crowns as you walked into that main entry there. There's a big cross in the lobby they put together. And these symbols are powerful. There, it's not religion. It's literally, literally dynamite. And so in the days to come, you're going to be reading this. I, I hope you all grab one of these. It's a little gift of ours. That you'll read this and you'll start thinking about the fact that these three symbols are not just symbols. They're dynamite. They're dynamite in your life and can be dynamite in your kid's life. Hey, yesterday was fun. We all, the kids ran after the Easter eggs and all that. And we, we have fun. That's just a tradition. It's not, I mean, the closest thing biblically to that is the pearl of great price. And, and actually Jews used to hide, uh, used to hide a piece of bread. And children would run around uh, their, the house and try to find that piece of unleavened bread. And uh, that's why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. See, Jesus was always referring to the fact that he was the weighted Messiah. So when you read this, it just keeps going. So this, in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the power of all three. Today I'm introducing it. Because I believe that if you understand those three symbols and you apply them to your life, it will dynamically help you live the abundant life. Can someone say abundant life? How many would like to live an abundant life? Now, I would suspect that some of you are struggling with that. I would suspect that some of you are not living it fully right now. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Either he was a liar, a lunatic, or truly was the son of God. 
He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever, verse 26, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked Mary that. And I want to ask you that question. Do you believe this? I had the pr privilege of doing Jerry's funeral a few weeks ago and, and uh, family that we loved in our church and he's on the other side. A sudden heart attack, sudden, uh, uh, we don't even know the exact causes why he passed, but he passed so quickly. We, the family didn't, couldn't even say goodbye to him. It was that fast because we don't know our days and we don't know our numbers. But when he went, I know exactly where he is. And I was able to quote this scripture. Do you believe this? And I, I challenge the family. Do you believe this is true? Because if we believe it, we believe that he's not really dead. He's just moved to another location. See, because the Bible says that when you die, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. I don't believe in a purgatory. It's not in the Bible. What I believe is, I believe in a heaven and I believe in a hell. And so I believe on Easter Sunday, let's make sure we're all going to heaven. But then the second question, are we bringing heaven to earth? You and I are called to bring heaven to earth. That's why my wife is fighting sex trade. She's bringing heaven to earth. That's why Pasquale and Norma go to Washington to help fight uh, some of the issues with immigration and justice issues. They're making a, gr a great, great difference. And I'm just wondering, do we realize that not only are we supposed to get ready for heaven, we're supposed to bring heaven to earth? Because if he really is a resurrection, People have been watching me online and skiing and kayaking and this and that. And they go, aren't you afraid of dying because all the altitude and all that and you almost died? And I said, man, if I die, I know where I'm going. I'm not really going to die. I'm just going to move. My spirit will be there. My soul will be there. And one day I'll have a resurrected body. But in the meantime, I'm fully conscious. My dad's already there. He's waiting for me. I get to see my dad healed. Because on earth, my dad was never healed emotionally. He had PTSD. But my dad now is in heaven and he's healed. And I'm going to see him one day. And this morning when I was in prayer, I was, I was saying, hey, Lord, tell my dad I love him. And I do. I love my dad. I wear this ring to honor him. A broken man that I had the pri privilege of leading to Jesus. My buddy Ron had a big part to play in that. He got my mom and dad to church. My only time in my whole life where they went to our church. And that was because Ron and Lynn made sure that my mom and dad were here. And my dad accepted Christ. You have to understand that he died that same year. Did I know? No, I didn't know he was going to die. Didn't know he was going to die. Why? Because I don't always know God's timing. The same year that our daughter had cancer, my dad had cancer. My daughter got healed. My dad died. Gang... Why do you allow the life circumstances to separate you from a relationship with God? It's like, man, we're mad at him, so well, I'm going to punish you, God, because I don't understand timing, and I, I don't understand suffering, and I don't understand why these things happen. Are we going to withdraw from God and the rest of our lives be away from the only one that can help us? I'm telling you what, the world's crazy, and I really believe that there's a Messiah, and the Messiah means he's the Savior. Do you believe this? Do you believe that you can be guaranteed heaven? Do you believe that actually you never die, you just move locations, heaven or hell? I don't know about you, but if, if we're wise, we all want to make sure we're going to heaven. You say, well, can, is it guaranteed? Yeah, you better believe it is. And I want to talk about that. Let's break it down just real quick. And I'm not going to keep you long because we have seven services today and we have seven services every Sunday. But tonight's play is going to be killer, and it's going to be amazing, and it's going to be awesome. Bring somebody! <laughs> All right. Three dynamic symbols. The cross. The cross represents the Messiah. They're waiting for him for over 1,040 years. The prophecy of Psalm 2 tells about this Jesus, tells about a Messiah. Isaiah 53 says it's going to be a suffering Messiah. They weren't ready for that. They were rather a ruling Messiah. Why? Because we think we know better than God. We tell God how to work. So all the Jews are saying, okay, we want a Messiah, but we want him to rule and reign and free us from the Romans. But Jesus was a suffering Messiah. Why? Because someone had to pay the debt for all of our sins. There's the crown, and that represents the Son of God. Why was he the Son of God? We're going to talk about that. And thirdly, we're going to talk about the heart. The one who came into the world, the Bible says he's the one who came. Look, look, what, look what she says. Check it out. Check it out. It says this. It says, 
this is Martha. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Messiah, the one the Jews have been waiting for for thousands of years. You're the son of God. That's what got him killed because he admitted that. We rented, Denise and I rented the passion so our grandkids could see it the other day, the passion of Christ and that scene in the temple with the Sanhedrin accusing him and he goes, I am. And the question was, are you the son of God? I am. See, when he said I am, that's the statement of God. When God calls himself by name, he goes, I am. I am the great I am. Am I going too fast? All right, son of God who is to come into the world. These are Martha's words. You're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, and you're the one that's supposed to come into the world. So let's break it down. What does it all mean, the cross? It means that he's the Messiah. He paid the price for all of your sins and my sins, for all your mistakes and my mistakes. Now think about that for a second. There's no other religion where your sins can be cleansed. None. If you're a Buddhist, and I, I, when I was in university, uh, of Ottawa, I studied religions because I was a seeker. I was majoring in business and philosophy. <laughs> Can you imagine that combination, business and philosophy? And I was studying the world religions. And Buddha, basically, by emptying yourself, somehow you'd reach a level of nirvana. And you would repeat a mantra, a word. And you'd repeat it over and over and over again to empty your brain and empty of everything else and somehow you'd reach some sense of enlightenment. But a Christian is not supposed to empty himself of everything here and here, but it's supposed to be full. Full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Word of God, full of love and compassion, full of forgiveness. So a Buddhist empties himself and a Christian fills himself. Somebody say amen. In Hinduism, they have thousands of gods. and If you go to India, and I've been probably 25, 30 times um, because we had a work there, and we go on the streets of India, and, and you'll be driving down the streets, and there'll be a big bull, literally a big bull, walking down the middle streets. Why? They don't touch the bulls uh, because they're gods in their brain. And so it's like chaos. <laughs> Derek, it's like chaos. The streets are chaos. Poverty is rampant. It's just chaos because everything, almost everything is a god to them. And there's not that sense of real repentance and forgiveness and value. A life is not worth very much. I heard that story the other day. Someone was in India and they saw a body laying there and people literally just walked over the body. It was a dead body. And someone threw a a sheet on it and kept walking. People stepped over the body because they were busy going to work or whatever. And I said, yeah, yeah, I've seen some things in India too. But see, that will never bring you happiness because it doesn't cleanse you of all your sins. Now, I could just start talking about all the major religions. There's no cleansing except for Christ. Christ is the only one that says, I paid it all for you. That's what the cross is. It's the the sacrificial debt paid for you. Okay, now let's be really honest. How many of you have ever made a mistake? Lift up your hand. Come on. All right. Now, the word sin means missing the mark. You kind of missed it. How many of you have ever missed it? Come on now, you've missed it. You've made mistakes, you've done stupid things. How many have ever said stupid things? Anybody ever? How many have ever done stupid things? All right, some of your hands are not up. I want to touch you. You must be the golden child or something. How many of you, okay, I'm going to help you out here. How many of you have ever thought stupid things? Come on now. So, so what do we find out from the cross? It's the only religion that says someone else will pay the debt for you. John, oh, I'm so proud of you and Jamie. I read an article about you this week. You had, who's that singer there, Judd, whatever her name is. She was at your, your graduation. Can you give John and Jamie a big hand? They're, they're some of my heroes. And I love the article because it said, you are now a national treasure. Isn't that cool? I thought that's the greatest testimony. The Bible says, let your good works be before men so they'll glorify your God in heaven. Bam. We're act, the Bible says you're actually the light of the world, the salt of the earth. But on the flip side, we know we all make mistakes. We know you can become a treasure of our city, the treasure of your family, a national treasure, a light, a blessing. You can become an amazing person. But then the other side of you, you know that you're a sinner. 
you know you've made mistakes. And the only religion that offers absolution is true Christianity. When you stop to think about the fact that Jesus Christ can wash away all your mistakes and all your sins. Paul was a murderer. He was a murderer and he murdered Christians. See, have you ever stopped to think on why we don't love each other? Did you see what happened in Sri Lanka? Did you see what happen, is happening now in Paris? 28 Saturdays of riots. I was there a few weeks ago on that Saturday. We're doing a, a healthy believers conference there while a riot is going on on the outside. And one of my friends has an open door to start ministering to the Gide Jones, the, the Yellow Jackets. And, 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 and he's an amazing guy. He was part of the Socialist Party. <laughs> you say, Paul, do you love socialists? Of course I love socialists. In America right now, I think people are having a hard time loving Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians or Independents. You know, the bottom line is we forget that we all have sinned and fallen short. In our society right now in America, we're just so much hatred and animosity and finger pointing. It's really sad. It's not Christ-centered. If we're Christians, we should love people. We should say, listen, Christ died for me like he died for you. I'm going to love you, brother. You may be a different color. If you look at our church, it's multicultural, multilingual. It's, it, our church is a whosoever church. We got millionaires in our church, and we got people just got off the streets in our church. But you know, that's the beauty of the gospel. The cross is the one thing that equalizes everything. Everybody say, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Look at someone say, you're forgiven. forgiven. The beautiful thing is it's a new deal. Not according to works. Not according to your sins. Not even according to your family. Not according to your pedigree. Not according to anything else but your new identity in Jesus Christ. When you look at your life, do you realize that the person that you're called to be as a Christian has a brand new identity? Why? Because your sins are forgiven. Don't you think that I stand up here sometimes and all the, the devil speaks to my brain? Because I don't see the devil. He's not in the blue dress. And I don't see him with a tail. He, but he speaks to my brain sometimes. He says, you're worthless. You're stupid. You're ugly. You can't. You're not worthy. My response is, but Jesus made me worthy. Somebody say, man, so say, Jesus made me worthy. Do you have a new identity in Jesus Christ? Because that's what the cross is. Well, I just can't forgive myself. Why not? Christ has forgiven you. I just can't forgive what I did. Why? Christ has forgiven you. If you've really come to the cross, you need to get up and go, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm blessed, God loves me, I'm a Christian, a Christ-centered person. Somebody say the cross is powerful. And the cross, I should see you through the cross. I should see you through the cross. No matter what your background is or what your color is, I, I've been praying, God, give me an open door to Antifa. You know the group that goes into places with a stick and, and beats people up? I want, I want to minister to them. You say, why? How can you win someone that you don't love? The cross makes me love people. Jesus said, love your enemies. At some point, this gospel should go through the cross. Are you, any, are you with me? If you're a Christian, say, the Bible even says, if you say you hate your brother, you're deceiving yourselves. We can't hate... We're, there, there's no room because of the cross. Because we forgive and we have to get, forgive. So everybody go like this. I forgive, I forgive. the Republicans. I forgive, I forgive. the Democrats. I forgive, I forgive. the Socialists, Socialist. the Antifa, the haters. the haters. In Jesus' name. See, what are you doing there? You're, you're living through the cross. The cross has become your filter, and it makes you saved, saved from hatred, saved from prejudice. He's the Messiah. You know, the word Messiah also means Savior. Now, my question is, what do we need to be saved from? Do we need to be saved from depression, from anger, from bitterness? Do we need to be saved from insecurity or saved from abuse? 
What do you need to be saved from today? Here's the second thing. So the cross is all about the Messiah. The crown is cool. You walk through the main lobby here, if you came through there, you, my beautiful, it was so amazing. You look at them, so, these crowns are so dainty, guys. And yet I had Donovan, big old Donovan with the big muscles and Don, big Don right there making these beautiful crowns. And then the other one was Colin, another big guy just making crowns. And I'm thinking, that's awesome! Because you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, I, I like Elvis Presley, but he's not the king. I liked Michael Jackson, and he wasn't my king, thank God. But when you look at people, they're not kings. And, and even when I see a king, my dad used to always say, everybody bleeds red. The person on the street demands as much respect as the queen or as a king. I've had the privilege of praying for presidents and had the privilege of praying for a chief of staff in India. I've had all these privileges. I've been with the king of Jordan. I've had all kinds of privileges. What? They're just people that bleed red. And when I see people through the cross and I see people with a crown, what does that mean? Because Jesus is the son of God. He says, listen, I'm going to die for you, rise again for you, so you can be adopted into my family. Imagine being raised in Bill Gates' family. That all of a sudden someone calls you this week, hey, Jim, I, I just want you to know that uh, I found out you're a lot, long lost relative of Bill Gates. He's got an extra billion dollars to hand out this week, and you're the hap. Would you like to receive this? You just have to take his name. I go, man, I'll take his name, I'll take his shoes, I'll take his boxer shorts, I don't care. When you actually realize that the Son of God calls you family, joint heirs of the throne, king's kids. Remember at 20 I wanted to kill myself and then someone gave me a book, I received Christ. Someone gave me a book that was called Destined for the Throne. It was all about the fact that I was a king's kid. So I'm walking around going, I'm a king's kid. I'm a king's kid. Why? Because at 20 I wanted to kill myself. I thought I had no future, I thought I had no value. But now I'm a king's kid. Someone say, I'm a, king's kid. I'm a king's kid. If truly you have the Son of God in your life, that makes you a king's kid. That makes you a prince, a princess. Guys, I want you to look at the ladies and say, you're a princess. Come on, tell the ladies, you're a princess. You're a princess. There's smiling going on here. Uh-oh. Now, ladies, I want you to look at the guys and go, you're a real prince. You're a real prince. And See, the beauty of the fact that he is the son of God is that he claimed to bring us into his family by his sacrifice and his resurrection. You might be a minority, you're no longer a minority. You're part of the greatest family of all time. You may come from a broken family. Guess what? You're from a spiritual family now. I grew up in a dysfunctional family. And when I came into Christ, I found I had new brothers and new sisters, and I, I had a whole new environment that loved me and cared for me in my, my future. When you read Psalm 2, it's so amazing because 1,040 years before the birth of Christ, 3,040 years ago, this was written. Verse 6, yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I'll declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. When you read this prophecy and then again in Isaiah 53, it talks about the suffering Messiah. Jesus was the long awaited son of God. The Jews won't argue with that. They won't argue with the fact that they're still waiting. So Pasquale and I were at the wall in Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, and uh, we were celebrating Shabbat with thousands and thousands of Jews. And as we were waiting and celebrating Shabbat, I knew that they're still waiting for the king. And we already had him. On the first trip down, we recognized that Jesus is the Son of God, and we celebrate Jesus. And a Latino and a French American now has Jesus as Savior. And my Jewish friends there were all dancing together and 
praying and shouting and crying together. It was really amazing. I'll never forget it. Never forget it. But I'm telling you right now that they're still waiting, but I found the king. And he's right there in the center of my life. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Recently I was at an event and at the end I, I prayed in the name of Jesus. I was so honored to, be, to have been invited. One of the leaders of that organization's name is David. He's a great man. He's my friend. And he asked me to pray. And all I wanted to do is just bring love and add value to people's lives. But I had to pray in the name of my king. I, I have no other name to pray in. I can't pray in Buddha's name. I can't pray in Krishna's name or Muhammad's name. I pray in Jesus' name. You see, the fact is, are you truly connected to the Son of God? Here's my last point. I want the team to come up. Do you believe this? Do you believe that he's the son of God? The only son of God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Do you believe this? Do you believe he's the son of God? Here's my last point. The heart. Martha said he's the one that was supposed to come into the world. I love the heart of God. You'll be studying it here. In fact, we also gave you this. In my heart, God will. I, be, I really believe in faith, and I believe in faith declarations. So that's what this is all about. In your heart, do you believe that God will do something in your life? And then I want you to write, the, write down what those somethings are. I hope you all have that. If not, at the end, come and pick them up at the altar. And I want you to put it in your refrigerator or on your car, and you can say, I'm praying that, that my kids will come back to Jesus, and I'm praying that my business will double or triple this year. Or I'm praying that, that I'm going to help my mom who's going through Alzheimer's. My mom right now is going through, she's 98 years old. She has suffering from dementia, and, and she's paralyzed. And man, I, I'm, just, I, I'm excited for her to go. We've already talked about her funeral, and I, I'm just waiting for that day where I can... I can weep at her casket and celebrate the fact that I know where mom's going. She's going to heaven. So I want you to do this. In, on these sheets, I'm going to ask you to write down your declarations. I believe that I'm going to live the abundant life. I believe that I'm going to win my family and friends to Christ. I believe that my business will prosper. I believe I'm going to get a scholarship to college. I met with someone just two days ago. they just gotten a full ride to a major university. See. There's declarations that you can make. The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 22, what you declare the Lord will establish. Why? Because you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You see, what's in your heart? The Bible even says that he'll give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that cool? So what's in the heart of God? To be a good father. To help you. To love you. What's in the heart of the father? To help you become a national treasure help you become maybe just a treasure to your family or to your school or to your industry imagine if your company became the best industry best company in that industry in our state influencing the state my daughter Christine and my son-in-law Lawrence have been going to the high schools and weeping saying God we want to go get into the schools our school system in the Nevada is still very weak and we believe that we're part of the solution. So they've been going out there praying and praying and praying and praying, crying and crying. And we just got an invitation through our Dream Center. They're saying, listen, we need help in our schools. Will the church come and help? And so we said, what will you allow us to do? They're opening up the door to the schools. And so our church is going to call other churches and say, hey, gang, the schools are open up. Just a few weeks ago, Number two in the prison system, Nevada, met for three, about three, four hours with us and then came again and had lunch with us the day after, talking about how churches can adopt prisons. Prison to reentry, man, is, we've got one of the greatest in the entire nation. Now we've got to go into the prisons and affect it in a greater way than ever before. What's in my heart? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put my list right here and I'm going to put it in my car and every time I drive, I'm going to remember the 10 things I'm going to ask of God. The Bible says he'll give me the desires of my heart. Why? Because he's a good father.